Now, as gunshots echo across the windswept, snow-covered reaches of the wild northwest, Quaker Puff Wheat and Quaker Puff Rice, the breakfast cereal shot from guns, present the challenge of the Yukon. It's Yukon King, swiftest and strongest lead dog of the northwest, blazing the trail for Sergeant Preston of the Northwest Mounted Police in his relentless pursuit of lawbreakers. On King, on you husky. Gold, gold discovered in the Yukon. A stampede to the Klondike in the wild race for riches. Back to the days of the gold rush. With Quaker puffed wheat and Quaker puffed rice, bringing you the adventures of Sergeant Preston and his wonder dog, Yukon King, as they meet the challenge of the Yukon. Up, 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 exploded up to eight times normal size. Yes, that's what happens to Quaker Pop Wheat and Quaker Pop Rice, because they're shot from guns. That's why these choice, flavor-rich premium grains are so crisp and tender. They're shot through and through with swell, nut-like flavor, too. Just pour out a bowlful and add some fruit and milk or cream. And yummy, you're back for more. For a deluxe treat, eat Quaker puffed rice and Quaker puffed wheat. Most of the stampeders who poured into the Yukon Territory were driven by a blind lust for gold or a restless urge for adventure. But some came for a different reason. They came to escape the past and start life over again under a new identity. Among the latter was a man named Edmund Grant. Grant was one of the lucky few who struck it rich. But one night as he sat alone in his cabin on Hunker Creek, he heard an ominous knocking at the door. And somehow he knew, even before he answered the knock, that the past had caught up with him. Hello, Grant. Or should I say Gary? I guess that's the name you're going under now, isn't it? How did you trace me up here? You don't expect me to discuss the matter while I'm standing out here in the cold, do you? All right. Come on in. That's better. I suppose you're not going to offer me a chair, so I won't wait for an invitation. How did you find me? I don't think we need to go into that. Point is, I did find you. What's more, I've discovered that you've made out pretty well for yourself. From what I've been able to find out, you've taken more than $100,000 worth of gold dust out of the ground. So? So, naturally, I want my share. I could be a hog and take everything you've got. But I'm a reasonable man. So I'll content myself with a modest $25,000. You filthy blackmailing skunk! Oh, now, now, let's not deal in personalities. Calling me names won't solve your problem. Uh, you're right. Maybe there's a better way. Don't come any closer, Grant. I wasn't foolish enough to come here unarmed. It's a good thing for you. You should learn to control your temper, my friend. That's what got you into trouble in the first place. Now, suppose we work it out like this. You go into Dawson tomorrow. Draw 25 grand out of the bank. And then meet me at my hotel at 12 o'clock. I'm staying at the Royal Albert. In room 319. Maybe I'll be there and maybe I won't. I'll, I'll have to think it over. All right, you think it over as much as you like. If you're not there, you know what the consequences will be. Edmund Grant had confided the secret of his past to only one man. And that was his partner, Hal Bishop. Hal had gone to Dawson on the evening that Latrobe paid his visit to their cabin. Soon after the blackmailer left... Hal returned from town. Hi, Ed. Oh, Hal. Say, you should have come into town with me tonight. I went to the Monte Carlo and... Oh, say, what's the matter with you? You look as though you just got measured for a casket. Uh, maybe you're not so far wrong at that. What are you talking about? Hal, a long time ago, you asked me how I ever happened to come up here to the Yukon. 
Yeah, I remember that. Well, I told you the truth because you're my best friend. I knew you could, I could trust you. I told you I killed a man named Karnak back in Chicago. I also told you a fellow named Latrobe was blackmailing me. Yeah, I know. You said you came up here to get away from him. Well, he's, he's found me. What's that? You mean Latrobe is... He was here tonight. He wants $25,000. Holy smoke. What are you going to do? Uh, I haven't decided yet. Well, don't pay the dirty scum. Don't worry. I'm not going to start that all over again. I've learned my lesson. The question is, what am I going to do? Listen, Ed. I'll tell you what. Draw your money out of the bank and clear out of the Yukon. Uh, leave Marion? Well, yes, for the time being. You can hightail it down a Skagway, get on a ship. Latrobe will never be able to trace you. No, Hal. That's not the answer. Well, then what is? I don't know what to think. But if I feel tomorrow morning like I feel right now, I'm going to the Mounties and confess. By morning, Edmund Grant's mind was made up. He told his partner that he had definitely decided to turn himself in to the Northwest Mounted Police. Hal waited for a short time after his partner left the cabin and started out for Dawson. And then he hitched up his own team and headed in the same direction. When he arrived in town, he went straight to the Royal Albert Hotel and knocked on the door of room 319. Yeah? Oh, it's you, Bishop. Hello, Latrobe. Come on in. You shouldn't have come here. Grant may show up any minute. He's not going to show up. What's that? I said he's not going to show up. He's going to the Mounties. To the Mounties? Of all the rotten luck. It's mighty bad luck for you, Latrobe. What are you talking about? He can't prove I was blackmailing him. He won't have to. I've got other plans. Now listen, Bishop. If you're getting panicky all of a sudden, don't go thinking you can squeal to the cops and save your own neck. You're in this just as deep as me and Karnak are. You think so? I know so. It was you that wrote and told me Grant was hiding out up here in the Yukon. And Karnak can testify that you met us after we arrived in Dawson and made a deal with us. You were going to get a cut of the blackmail money. Sorry, Latrobe. I've been playing you for a sucker right from the what, start. What do you mean? The real reason I got you up here was to scare Ed into running away. That'd leave me in control of the claim. And what's more important, it'd leave me a clear field with Ed's girl. Oh, you dirty double-crossing rat. Well, now that my plan hasn't worked out, I'll have to try a different tack. Oh, hey, <clears throat> put away that knife. Don't. Don't do it. No. A short time later, Edmund Grant and his fiancée, Marion Lee, called on Sergeant Preston at Mounted Police Headquarters. Sergeant? This is Marion Lee, the girl I'm going to marry. Or maybe I should say the girl I'd hope to marry. How do you do, Miss Lee? How do you do, Sergeant? I asked Ed to let me come along because what he's going to tell you is important to both of us. Oh, I see. Sit down, please. Oh, thank Hi. you. What is it you want to tell me, Ed? Sergeant, I've come to make a confession. A confession? Of what? Of murder. You see, I killed a man back in Chicago two years ago. A man named Sam Karnak. How did it happen? Well, it all started one night in a cafe. Karnak insulted me and I knocked him down. The next day, he sent me a message asking me to meet him that evening so we could talk things over. He said if I didn't show up, he was going to sue me for assault. You kept the appointment? Yes, but instead of talking things over, Karnak pulled a gun on me. I grappled with him and the gun went off. Anyone hear the shot? Yes, a fellow named Frank Latrobe heard it. it. Just happened he was coming to call on Karnak at that particular moment. Oh, he heard the shot and came bursting in. Did he call the police? Oh, he threatened to at first, but, well, then he changed his mind. He said if I paid him $5,000, he'd dispose of Karnak's body and keep his own mouth shut. I suppose you agreed. Yes. Well, you can guess what happened after that. Latrobe kept on blackmailing me, and finally I got desperate. I decided the only way out was to disappear. So I came up here to the Yukon and assumed the name of Ed Gary. My real name is Ed Grant. Well, Ed, I don't want to raise any false hopes, but has it occurred to you that you might have been tricked? What do you mean? Did you ever read in the paper that Karnak's body had been found? Well, no, but I assume that was because Latrobe had buried it somewhere. Or, anyway, he'd done a good job of getting rid of it. Making a man think he's murdered someone and then blackmailing him for it. It's one of the oldest confidence games in the book. Oh, Ed, maybe the sergeant's right. Holy mackerel. I never even thought of that. Mind you, I don't say that's what did happen, but it might have been a frame-up from what you've told me. You mean Karnak got me to his place that night just on purpose to stage a fake murder scene? It's possible. Karnak pulls a gun loaded with blanks, maneuvers you into taking it away from him and shooting him. Then Latrobe brushes in just in time to catch you red-handed. Certainly has all the earmarks of a put-up job. 
Ed, it all sounds so logical the way the sergeant just explained it. I'm sure that's what happened. What made you come here and confess all of a sudden, Ed? Oh, Latrobe finally caught up with me. You mean he's here in the territory? He's right here in Dawson at the Royal Albert Hotel. He showed up at my cabin last night and demanded $25,000. I was supposed to pay him by noon today. In that case, we'll set a trap for him. You can pay him in marked money and I'll arrest him as soon as he accepts it. Oh, what a pleasure that'll be. Come in. Sergeant. What is it, Constable? There's just been a murder over at the Royal Albert Hotel. Who was killed? A man named Frank Latrobe. Frank Latrobe! Ed, you better come along with me to identify him. Miss Lee, I'm afraid you'll have to excuse us for the time being. A short time later, Sergeant Preston arrived at the hotel, accompanied by Ed Grant and a police surgeon. As he showed them to the dead man's room, the hotel manager remarked, This is one uh, murder you won't have any trouble solving, Sergeant. Oh, how so? You'll see in just a minute. And here we are. Sergeant, look. He wrote the murderer's name on the wall just before he died. Yes, and the name he wrote is Edmund Grant. We'll continue our adventure in just a moment. So you two kids want to play your whistle game today? Yes, sir. Now, as I get it, Billy, Sandra and I can say anything we want about Quaker puffed wheat and Quaker puffed rice. And you stop us with the whistle if you think we're wrong. But I can trip you up, too. All right, just you try and do it. You can't stop me when I say there's nothing tastes quite as scrumptious for breakfast as a heaping bowl of delicious, crisp Quaker puffed wheat or Quaker puffed rice topped with milk or cream and fruit. I got you there. A second bowl of Quaker puffed wheat or rice tastes just as well as the first. Well, I have to admit you're right. But you won't trip us up on the fact that premium grains of wheat and rice are shot from guns, actually exploded up to eight times normal size. So they taste crisp and delicious as nuts in November. You're wrong. I say Quaker puffed wheat and Quaker puffed rice Tastes even better than nuts in November. Well, he tripped us up again, Sandra. But let him try to do it on the subject of nourishment. Quaker puffed wheat and rice furnish extra food values of restored natural grain amounts of vitamin B1, niacin, and iron. And I know for sure about the picture of the smiling Quaker man on the front of every package of Quaker puffed wheat and Quaker puffed rice. Yes, that's the way all you fellas and girls can be sure of getting the swellest tasting breakfast ever. The one and only Quaker puffed wheat and Quaker puffed rice. They're never sold in bags or bulk. So always remember to buy the big red and blue packages with the picture of the smiling Quaker man on the front. He's your guarantee that you're getting the one and only Quaker puffed wheat and Quaker puffed rice. Shot from gun. Now to continue. A sinister blackmailer named Frank Latrobe had been found murdered in his hotel room. On the wall beside the body, the name Edmund Grant had been scrawled, apparently by the dying man. At the sight of the damning evidence, Ed Grant exclaimed in despair. Sergeant, surely you don't believe I killed him. I haven't arrived at any conclusions yet, Ed. However, you certainly had a motive for killing Latrobe. There's no doubt that he's guilty, Sergeant. The Trove certainly knew who his own murderer was. He wouldn't have written that Grant's name on the wall if Grant wasn't the one who stabbed him. Probably not. But how do we know the name was written by Latrobe? The murderer could have written it himself. Mm, well, maybe so. How long has Latrobe been dead, Doctor? Not very long, Sergeant. Probably not more than half an hour or so. The knife went right through his heart. Through his heart? In that case, he must have died instantly, didn't he? That's right, Sergeant. Then he couldn't have written that name on the wall. In other words, someone tried to frame me. I told you I didn't kill him, Sergeant. How many people knew that Latrobe had been blackmailing you, Ed? Well, uh, I've just told two people beside you, Sergeant. Who are they? Well, one is Marion and... You said you told her this morning, didn't you? That's right. Did the two of you come straight to headquarters after you told her? Of course. Who's the other person you told? Well, my partner, Hal Bishop. How long has he been in on the secret? Oh, he's known for a long time. 
since we first became partners. Would he have any motive for framing you? Oh, Hal? He's got no motive at all. If that's true, there's only one alternative. What's that? Latrobe must have had an accomplice who was in on the blackmail plot. You mean the accomplice killed him? It's the only possible explanation if you and Hal Bishop are innocent. Your fiancé couldn't have killed him, and no one else knew you were involved with Latrobe. Yes, it certainly adds up. Clint, how long has Latrobe been staying here at the hotel? Well, not very long. I think he just checked in day four yesterday. Anyone come with him? Well, uh, now let me see... Yes, by golly, there was someone with him, a fellow named uh, Karnak. Karnak? Oh. Yeah, that's right. He took a separate room. Is he still here at the hotel? He hasn't checked out, if that's what you mean. What's his room number? He's downstairs in 210. Come on, Ed. We'll pay a call on Mr. Karnak. Should be quite an experience meeting a man you shot to death two years ago. With the hotel manager leading the way, Sergeant Preston and Ed Grant went downstairs to Karnak's room. This is it right here, 210. I don't hear anyone inside. Have you a pass key, Clint? Yeah, yeah, sure. I got one right here. What? The room's empty. What does Karnak look like? Well, he's a big, heavy set fellow with a dark beard. His uh, nose is sort of crooked. Looks as though it might have been broken sometime or other. Well, that's him, all right. Ed, I'm fairly certain you didn't kill the Trump, but you'd better stay in town until his case is cleared up. Suppose you go back to headquarters and wait there for the time being. All right, Sergeant. Anything you say. In the meantime, King and I will try to locate Karnak. Later that same afternoon, a bearded man traveling by dog sled halted his team in front of the cabin shared by Ed Grant and Hal Bishop. Oh, oh, oh there. Karnak. Hello, Bishop. You fool. What come here for? I had to. The trove's been murdered. Murdered? You heard me. Well, who killed him? Who do you suppose? You mean Grant? Sure, I mean Grant. Holy smoke. How did you find out? And the hotel's in an uproar. Everybody's talking about it. From what they say, the trove wrote Grant's name on the wall just before he died. Have they um, arrested Grant yet? Yeah. I saw a Mountie come in the lobby and he had Grant with him. Did Grant see you? No. There was a whole mob of people milling around. I still don't say why you had to come here. I had to go somewhere. If I stick around town, the Mounties will nab me. Nab you? Why should they? Use your head. By this time, Grant spilled the beans about Latrobe Merton blackmailing him. What if he has? What if he has? Once the Mounties find out I checked him with Latrobe, they'll get wise to the whole deal. They'll know I'm the guy Grant's supposed to have killed. Yeah, I never thought of that. But even so, they've got nothing to worry about. They can't prove a blackmail charge without evidence. Are you crazy? Grant killed Latrobe because he was being blackmailed. Ain't that evidence enough? Well, what do you expect me to do about it? I expect you to hide me out or help me make a getaway, that's what. Just remember you're in this just as deep as I am. The Mounties arrest me, I'll talk my head off. So you better make doggone sure they don't catch me. Did you check out of the hotel? Of course not. That would look too suspicious. I figured the smartest thing to do was just slip away when I had the chance. Hey, someone's coming. Wait a minute. I'll take a look out the window. Holy smoke. Now, who is it? It's a Mountie sergeant named Preston. A Mountie? For Pete's sake, what am I going to do? Keep your shirt on. Probably just came here to tell me about Grant being arrested. Yeah, but what happens if he finds me here? He does know you from Adam. Let's see. I'll tell him you're a friend of mine named Johnson. Now, keep back out of sight. All right. Maybe he won't even come in. Okay. Oh, hi there, Sergeant Preston. Hello, Hal. What brings you this way? I'm trailing a man named Karnak. Apparently, he came here to your cabin. Came here? Why, you must be mistaken, Sergeant. Whose team is that? It uh, belongs to a man named Johnson. He came here to visit my partner, Ed Grant. The inside? Uh, why, yes. Then I'll go in and talk to him. All right. Get your hands up, Marty. And don't let that muck come any closer. I'll plug him. Steady, King. Steady, boy. So your visitor's name is Johnson, eh, Hal? Now, don't get me wrong, Sergeant. That's the name he gave me. Like I told you, you came here to see Ed. You can cut out that innocent stuff, Bishop. You're in on a blackmail along with me in Latrobe. You fool. But can't you keep your mouth shut? Why should I? If you hadn't pulled that gun, you might have fooled him. A ah, fat chance. I heard what he told you. He trailed me here from town. I suppose you were both in on the murder. What? Both in on the murder? You mean Latrobe's murder? That's right. What are you talking about? It was Grant that killed Latrobe. I heard all about it back at the hotel. 
He wrote Grant's name on the wall before he died. Sorry, Karnak, but your frame-up didn't work. Stop talking riddles. Latrobe was stabbed through the heart, which means he died instantly. In other words, he couldn't possibly have written Grant's name on the wall. That leaves only two possible suspects, you and Hal Bishop. What's that? Figure it out, Karnak. Grant wouldn't try to frame himself, and you two are the only other persons who knew he was connected with Latrobe. Why, you dirty double-crossing rat, Bishop. That was you that killed Latrobe. Don't be a fool. Why should I kill him? In other words, you're accusing Karnak of the murder. Accusing me? Why, Shut you... up and simmer down. I'm not accusing you of anything. Can't you see he's just trying to play us against each other? Don't hand me that. I know doggone well I didn't kill Latrobe, so you must have. All right, all right. So what if I did? We can discuss that later. The big problem right now is how to get rid of this money. What do you mean, get rid of him? We can't leave him here alive. Listen, if you think I'm dumb enough to kill a Mountie up here in the Yukon, you got another thing coming. What else can we do with him? Tie him up and hightail it out of here. And how far do you think we'd get before they nabbed us? I'd rather take my chances on that than swing for murder. And you're a bigger fool than I thought you were. Haven't you heard how these Mounties never give up till they get their man? If you leave Preston here alive, he's sure to track you down sooner or later. If we kill him, we can get rid of the body and no one will ever know he trailed you here. Maybe you're right at that. Sure, I'm right. What's more, if you help me do away with Preston, I'll pay you $5,000. Five thousand? All right, it's a deal. You're making a big mistake, Karnak. No one's asking you, Preston. What do we do, plug him right now? No, too many cabins around here. Someone would hear the shot. And what's your plan? I'll tie him up and gag him, keep him here till it's dark. Then we'll load him in a sled, take him into the woods. We can kill him and find his body someplace where no one will ever find it. Yeah, good idea. You keep him covered. I'll go out to the woodshed and get some rope. As Hal Bishop went out of the cabin, Sergeant Preston noticed that he left the cabin door standing ajar. A plan flashed into the Mountie's head. If he could distract Karnak's attention, King could make a dash for freedom through the open doorway. Looking Karnak straight in the eye, the sergeant began to move slowly away from King. Stand still, Preston. I have my hands up. What are you worried about? I said stand still. If this really frightens you, I'll stop, but I don't see why you should get so nervous. The great dog, Yukon King, stood watching his master intently, waiting for the command he sensed was coming. Suddenly, the sergeant spoke. Go, King! A gray streak flashed out the doorway. Karnak whirled and exclaimed in baffled rage. Pretty smart, aren't you, Preston? I got along. Meanwhile, King was racing around to the rear of the cabin. As he approached the woodshed, he saw Hal Bishop standing inside. Hal turned, and his jaw dropped in dismay as the great dog charged with a ferocious snarl. The terrified man groped for a club, but before he could use it, King had knocked him off his feet. Inside the cabin, Karnak and Sergeant Preston heard the faint sounds of the struggle going on inside the woodshed. It's that dog of yours. He's got a hold of Bishop. I wouldn't be a bit surprised. Turn around and keep your hands up. All right. As Preston obeyed the order, Karnak came up close behind him and jammed his gun in the sergeant's back. Not get moving. Get out that door and don't try any false moves. The sergeant was thinking fast. As he stepped out of the cabin, he suddenly turned his head as though King were waiting just outside the door and shouted... Take him, King! Hey, what the... Karnak whirled to meet the surprise attack. Preston whirled around, grabbed the crook's gun hand and dealt him a terrific blow to the head. Karnak staggered but kept hold of the gun. As the two men grappled desperately, the gun went off. The sergeant was twisting Karnak's wrist. Stop it, Karnak. With an agonized gasp, Karnak let go of the gun. It dropped in the snow. And a moment later, it was kicked several yards away as the two men struggled back and forth. Meanwhile, King had heard the shot and came running back to the front of the cabin to help his master. Hal Bishop followed close behind the great dog. He saw the gun lying in the snow. As he darted toward it, the sergeant landed a punch that knocked Karnak out. Hal was just picking up the gun. Before he could take aim and fire, the sergeant drilled him with a shot from the hip. You're lucky I didn't shoot to kill. You and Karnak are under arrest in the name of the Queen. To save himself, Karnak eagerly agreed to testify that Hal Bishop had admitted murdering Latrobe. And Hal, seeing that his position was hopeless, made a full confession. That evening, after he and Karnak had been taken back to Dawson and locked up in jail, Sergeant Preston discussed the case at headquarters with Ed Grant and his fiancée. Ed was stunned by the news of his partner's treachery. I can hardly believe it, Sergeant. Why on earth did Hal want to frame me? Well, for one thing, he hoped to take over your share of the claim. For another thing, he was in love with Marion and wanted to get you out of the picture. I knew he was kind of sweet on Marion before we got engaged, but... 
Well, I thought he was being a good sport about the whole thing. Did he bring those two blackmailers up here just on purpose to frame Ed for murder? No, originally he just intended to betray Ed to the Chicago police as a fugitive from justice. But when he wrote the chief of police in Chicago, he got a reply saying he must be mistaken, no such crime had ever been committed. So then he wrote to Latrobe, is that it? That's right. You had told him that Latrobe ran a little cafe called the Ten Spot, so it wasn't hard to get in touch with him. Even then, he wasn't planning to kill the chove. He just wanted to scare you into running away. Yeah, I remember that. Oh, he tried to talk me into going down a skagway and getting on a ship. When you refused, he decided to frame you for murder. Well, thank heavens it's all over with. Yes, and what a relief to know that I never killed Karnak after all. Why, for two years I've been thinking I was a murderer. You did the wise thing in coming to the police, then. I certainly realize that now, Sergeant. I just wish I'd done it a long time ago. I suppose the next wise thing you're going to do is make Mary and Mrs. Grant. <laughs> That's right, Sergeant. We're getting married tomorrow. And we want you to be best man. It'll be a pleasure, Em. <laughs> yes, King, old boy, this case is closed. In just a moment, Sergeant Preston will give you a preview of Monday's adventure. Here's the breakfast that wins the praise of so many top action Hollywood movie stars. It's Quaker Puffed Wheat. Or Quaker Puffed Rice. These ready-to-serve cereals are shot from guns. They're crisp and tender. They're shot through and through with nut-like flavor, too. Pour yourself a bowl full of Quaker Puffed Wheat or Quaker Puffed Rice. Add milk or cream, top with fruit. It's keen. It really hits the spot. And it's good for you. Take a tip. Ask Mom to order both delicious kinds in the big red and blue Quaker packages. That's Quaker puffed wheat and Quaker puffed rice. They're never sold in bags or bulk. Listen Monday when Sergeant Preston and Yukon King meet the challenge of the Yukon... In the adventure, The Cascade Case. King and I were on duty in the little town of Cascade when we caught two men trying to steal a dog team. I didn't know it at the time, but in the terrifying hour that followed, I learned that I was in the hands of two desperate killers without any visible means of escape. Be sure to hear this exciting adventure Monday. These radio dramas, a feature of the challenge of the Yukon Incorporated are created by George W. Trendle, produced by Trendle Campbell Enterprises, directed by Fred Flowerday, and supervised by Charles D. Livingston. The part of Sergeant Preston is played by Paul Sutton. They are brought to you every Monday, Wednesday, and Friday at the same time by Quaker Puffed Wheat and Quaker Puffed Rice. The breakfast cereal shot from guns. For a delicious hot breakfast, eat Quaker Oats. The giant of the cereals is Quaker Oats. Delicious, nutritious, makes you feel ambitious. The giant of the cereals is Quaker Oats. Say, boys and girls, do you want to be a star someday in sports and activities? Then start on good Quaker Oats breakfast tomorrow. Because nourishing oatmeal gives you more growth and endurance than any other whole grain cereal. Remember, Quaker and Mother's Oats are the same. This is J. Michael wishing you goodbye, good luck, and good health from Quaker Pop Wheat and Quaker Pop Rice.